now a little bit about our moderator for tonight's conversation. I am very pleased to be welcoming her to the virtual event gallery or readings gallery tonight. Kelly Evert is one of three co-owners of Village Books and Paper Dreams. She has been in the independent book business since 1989 when she started work for working for Port Book and News in Port Angeles, Washington. She's a musician, she's a mother, and of course, she is an avid, avid reader. So we're so glad she's joining us tonight. And now for our featured author. Jacqueline Winspear was born and raised in the county of Kent, England. She immigrated to the United States in 1990. And while working in business and as a personal professional coach, she embarked on a lifelong dream of to be a writer. She subsequently became a regular contributor to journals covering international education and travel and has published articles in the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, and other publications. Her short stories have appeared in magazines internationally, and Jacqueline has recorded her essays for KQED Radio in San Francisco. She has contributed to several anthologies of essays and short stories. She's the author of the award-winning Maisie Dobbs series, as well as nonfiction works, including a new memoir. This time next year, we'll be laughing. She's here tonight to discuss the latest installment in the Maisie Dobbs series, this one right here, The Consequences of Fear. So please, a warm welcome for Jacqueline Winspear and Thank Kelly you. Evert. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there were just a couple of things. That, you know, I read your book, uh, the very first book, uh, a while back. And then I did some research before tonight. And I found we had a couple of things in common because I was an exchange student in London and went to the University of London for a wee bit. Oh. Yes. And my yes. cousin still lives over there. So I used to have family over there. And I also lived um, north of San Francisco when I was a child. So, oh, there you the area. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I was really I thrilled to have yeah. the, those things in common. With and that's where it stopped. But no, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a writer. Um, you're, you're a musician, aren't you? I mean, I'm not a musician, yeah. but my husband is. Oh. And um, yeah, yeah. And uh, every time I say that, I always remember that old joke that. Um, I can remember I told him when we first ever met, I said, you know what they call, was it? The definition of uh, homeless is a musician without a girlfriend. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> which I thought was really, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> Did he? Then, he chortled a bit. <laughs> okay. I, thought, I think he thought she's assuming a lot. <laughs> but, uh, th there you go. Um, but yeah, another, well, maybe fun. another point of connection. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> so I, I also have the, the book right here. Um, and so I'm just going to just jump right in and just ask you, um, where did you find the inspiration for this latest book? Okay, so, um, you know, the book begins with uh, this young boy, Freddie Hackett who is a runner of messages uh, during, it opens in 1941, in October 1941. Britain has been at war for two years by then. And he is a message runner, and he doesn't quite know who he runs messages for. Um, he just knows he goes from this office to that office or this office to that office, and, uh, and then to other places where he has to take, uh, you know, maybe an envelope or something like that. But he's actually running between different offices of the Secret Service. And on one night, it's uh, what they call a bomber's moon. And um, a bomber's moon, they call because it was, you know, so good for the Luftwaffe if there was a full moon, because it absolutely lit up the River Thames in London. And also, if they were heading towards other British cities, you know, there's invariably a river somewhere. But particularly in London, it came along by the docks and they wanted to hit the docks. They wanted to hit, um, they also wanted to hit shipping because they wanted to starve Britain. But anyway, um, it was a bomber's moon, so Freddie has a view of everything that's going on and he sees, um, he sees a, a, one, a man take the life of another man. And uh, and then the story weaves from there. So the inspiration for the story, you know, the inspiration for many of my stories, and sometimes it's it's just a, a you know a little seedling. It's not 
the whole story. It's a seedling of thought, if you will, that takes me into a story. And sometimes there's another seedling that joins it and another seedling. So I, it, it's like a, you know, growing, growing a garden in a way. But the first seedling was actually laid down long before I became um, a writer of fiction. I was a professional writer at the time, and I also had a day job, as many professional writers do. Um, <clears throat> but my, my parents were visiting from the UK, and they came to my home in, in California. And we're all sitting in the kitchen. We had a big kitchen table. And um, I happened to mention that my dad was a very fast runner at school. Now, he was a really fast runner. Um, it was, I think he would have loved it if either my brother and I had also been sprinters, but we weren't. We were actually pretty good long distance runners because he always used to take us over to the field and time us over 100 <laughs> yards. And, oh, I, <laughs> and we never quite did it in the time that he would have liked us to do it. But when he was a boy, <laughs> he was fast. And he told this story that I had never heard before. Um, after one of my friends said to him, you know, I said, oh, your dad used to be a really fast runner and he really loves running now. I mean, he can't walk anywhere. And he said, oh, Mr. Winsby, he said, if you were that fast a runner at school, he said, were you a, a, a message runner in the, in the war? And my dad said, well, funny you should ask me that, son, because I was. And I looked at him and my mum looked at him and said, well, this is news to us. Oh. He'd never, he'd never told, oh. he'd never told Oh, my about gosh. It. And it could have been because he was a boy and therefore it was just what he did. But so this story emerged that it was just before the war was Britain declared war on Germany after what happened in Poland. The ARP, which was the um, air raid precautions uh, people, um, they went to schools around London and it probably happened in other cities as well. But my dad lived in London and they went to schools looking for fast runners, but they had to be able to run a certain distance in a certain time. And my dad, with other boys, was plucked out of his school and he became a message runner. So after school, he would report to a depot where they would give him messages to run. And he would have to go between these different places. And, and how old was he at the time? Uh, he would have been just coming up to 13. Oh my gosh. Wow. So he was a boy. He was a boy. Yeah. And in fact, in my most recent newsletter, I showed a picture. It wasn't my father, but of an a an ARP message runner. And that boy looks about 12. He looks about my dad's age. And my dad said he could always remember his PT teacher saying to him, you know, because he was being trained for um, competitions beyond the school. And, and, you know, sport was a way for kids in my dad's area of London to get out of that area of London. And... He really wanted that. He wanted, he loved his running. And the, <laughs> apparently the uh, teacher said to him, you know, I'm afraid, son, the war is spoiling the chances of boys like you because you'll be too old by the time it ends. And, and he said, you'll be in the army or something, which is exactly what happened to my dad. But it's, it was so interesting. When he told that story, even though I was not a writer of fiction, I can remember thinking there is a story there. And um, I know you've probably got loads of other questions, but I have one more little thing to add to that. And that is, you know, we've all been watching things online lately that maybe we wouldn't normally watch because, oh, well, let's try this, let's try that. And um, about 10 days ago, I watched a documentary about the famous hairstylist Vidal Sassoon, you know, that 60s uh -huh. little uh -huh. cut he did. And um, it was interesting to me because my cousin, that's where she trained to be a hairdresser. And what was fascinating is that when he was brought back from evacuation at the age of 14, because that was the age that you went out to, to work in Britain, mm -hmm. especially if you came from a working class background, which he did, he became a messenger. But he was a bike messenger. He actually saved up and he got his dad, his dad lent him the money for a bike or something. So he became a bike messenger. And he described exactly what my dad must have seen, which my dad didn't describe in detail, but, you know, going through bombings and the things he saw as he was running messages. And I imagined my dad, as Freddie Hackett does in The Consequences of Fear, running along and what you're seeing as you go is things that a boy, a child should never see. 
And that is the truth of war. Children see things that really we think children shouldn't see, but they do. It's how it happens. So it was such a coincidence, especially as I watched it just before The Consequences of Fear was published. So that was the, the, the part of the inspiration. And of course, Freddie Hackett is part of the story, but it's right. where the story begins. Wow. That is quite a story. <laughs> that whole thing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, so one of my other questions, uh, when you imagine Maisie, how has she changed and grown over the years since your first book? Um, well, she's, she's matured. She's got older. She's more mm -hmm. at ease in, in with, her, with who she is. And, you know, one of the things that I did when I, ha when I knew I was writing a series, because when I wrote the first book, I just thought, I'm writing this book that's in my head. But as soon as I was asked about the next book in the series and I realized I had to quickly think on my feet, I realized that one of the things I wanted to do was to have not only an arc to each story, but there would be an overall arc to the series. Mm -hmm. So I had a body of work over a period of time, but I wanted there to be an arc to each character. And so I would say as much as I create Maisie Dobbs, so she reveals herself to me, but I've brought her through time and through different experiences and although sometimes people say, well, a lot of bad things have happened to her. Well, you know, a lot of bad things happen to a lot of people during that time period. It, nothing that happens to her is unusual, except, you know, I suppose in the, the mapping of love and death, um, she, she, her, her circumstances changed dramatically, which was actually a really interesting thing to do for me because it meant she had to accommodate that. And I wanted to find out how does she accommodate, accommodate such a change in circumstance? And who does she become? And what does she learn along the way? And those have really been my questions all the way along. So how has she changed? She has matured. She's in an age where it's almost like she fits into her skin now. She knows who she is. That does not mean to say she is always confident. But she is more, certainly not the the... the the younger woman that we met in 1929 um, when she was in you know, her early 30s, you know, 31, 32. Um, and of course, we really first met her when she was just a girl because of the backstory that emerged. Um, so it's the it's, it's for me what's, uh, I, I think, really compelling in, in the writing of a series is, is that I'm able to explore character in a very organic way. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed that. It's a different experience than um, having to explore character in a standalone novel, which I did with The Care and Management of Lies, which was a different, mm -hmm. it wasn't even a mystery. But, um, but how has she grown and changed? Well, I would say she's, she's, a, she's an older version of the earlier version, but just as we all change over time and we perhaps get more comfortable in our skin, we get a sense of who we are by our early 40s, that's where she is. That's where she is. She's not afraid to be who she is anymore. So how long did you have Maisie in your head developing and and how did you get her into World War One? With the first oh, it, it was it was it was uh, an instant experience. I never planned to write fiction. I always thought I would be the writer of nonfiction. My ambition was to write um a biography of someone that no one had written a biography of before or a book, uh, um, you know, that was, I don't know, brought together my uh, interviewing. I love interviewing people. I love meeting people, interviewing them. And I was doing a lot of that for the um, work on assignment that I was doing. I should probably have worked for People magazine or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Get, I, I'm not phased by, by celebrities, but I do like to know who they really are. Um, but um, actually, it was just a joke. I really couldn't have done that job. But, um, um, but one of the things I have always been interested in is women's history. So what actually happened to me, and I know there are readers out there who, who know this story. I was on my way to work and I was working a sales job at the time because I wanted a job that I didn't take home in the evening and at weekends because I had worked in that corporate environment 
-hmm. and, and but I wanted to have time for my writing and I was doing a lot of it. And so I was driving to work one morning, stuck in traffic and literally at a stoplight and there's all the traffic was stopped in front of me and it was pouring with rain like it does in California when it rains. And <laughs> You know, it never rains in California, but it pours. We know that song. Yeah. <laughs> and literally, I'm, I'm a bit of a daydreamer, I must admit. And so I'm in this little zone. And suddenly, I saw this woman in my mind's eye come up through Warren Street Station. And I knew it was Warren Street Station, even though it looked different, because that's how I used to get to work when I worked in Fitzroy Square. And she came up through the station. She Instead of going through sort of electronic turnstile. She went through an old fashioned turnstile. Mm -hmm. She was dressed in the garb of the mid 1920s. She came out, she had a conversation with a newspaper vendor who had an opinion about her, which was wrong. And then she walked down the street, stood outside a building, took out an envelope, there are keys inside. And she goes into the very shabby office she has rented. And then suddenly I heard all these cars honking. <laughs> and, <Move. laughs> and 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 I'm I could swear I heard someone say are you waiting for any particular shade of green lady and all the cars had moved on so I quickly had to step on it but by the time I got to work I had so much of that story in my head it was all coming to me and I couldn't wait to get home and start to write <clears throat> and that night I wrote the first chapter which has barely changed since and that was my first ever fiction since I was a kid and wrote things like Once Upon a Time and then right. they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> and um, I've often referred to that as a moment of artistic grace because that's how it felt. And yet those moments don't happen in a vacuum. And not only have I always been interested in women's history ever since I was a child, I've also been very interested in the years between just before the First World War right up until, say, the end of rationing after the Second World War, which means, let's say, about 1910 to 1955-56. Rationing officially ended at the end of 1954, uh, wartime rationing, so 10 years after the war. But I think sugar was still rationed until 1956, you know, and things like that. So there were things you couldn't get. So that was Maisie Dobbs. And... It's really funny. I can remember thinking at the time, how can I ever tell anyone that that's how it happened? And I thought, well, you know, J.K. Rowling had six Harry Potters on a train. Right. So I can get one Maisie Dobbs stuck in traffic in California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. You know, I'm not And was it a mystery when you, as you were sitting well, there at the green light? <laughs> yeah. It's, the funny thing was, because she was an investigator, I always knew that. She was a psychologist and an investigator. That okay. was her thing. And so there, there was a mystery, but when the book first came out, and this kind of thing is far more common now, but when Maisie Jobs first came out, people didn't quite know what to do with it because it was considered cross-genre. So I would go into a bookstore and I would see it under histor historical novels. Um, I saw in one bookstore, anti-war, another one under political, another one under obviously mystery or else it was there was one copy in every place just in case yeah. <laughs> another and also literary just fiction covering. I mean they were covering all the bases mm -hmm. um, but of course now I think more and um, more and more people um, more and more publishers are, are you know it's it's quite normal now to have books that are can fit in so many different right. places but it wasn't then and and I think it was a challenge you know where do we put this? But of course, it had a mystery. So that was the first place to put it. And after that, you know, the series becomes a his historical mystery series. But I still get I get a lot of uh, emails from veterans who read the books, for example, yeah. and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, so it's interesting. The readership has always been interesting to me, you know, and I consider myself very fortunate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And to have so many books, I mean, you just keep that series going. It, it's fantastic for all of us. <laughs> well, Cle Cleo, a lot the, in there, though. <laughs> Cleo is the muse of history, and uh, I think she sits on my shoulder. And you know, then the other big question you ask when you're developing character is, "How would I feel if?" And you just have to try and get yourself to, "How would I feel if that were me in that position?" with this kind of background, what would I do? What would I think? What would I feel? And right. then you go from there.
Yeah. Wow. And so you wrote, you wrote nonfiction, but did you read mysteries or read Nancy Drew when you were younger? And Never so you read were, Nancy Drew. No? I don't even remember knowing about Nancy Drew. Oh. <laughs> I don't know that she was that as big in Britain, to tell you the truth, although sure. I know people have read her, but, um, you know, the, the first real mystery I ever read was um, The Franchise Affair by uh, Josephine Tay when I, I guess I was about 12. But before that, I was I was always a classics girl. I mean, that you know, I was I, I was schooled in Britain. I mean, you know, we're raised on Jane Austen, and, Jane Austen, right. and, and, and you know, Bronte. the Brontes and Charles Dickens, you know, and and uh, and people like that. And I'm, my world opened up in a different way when I was about, I guess, sixteen, and I discovered all these American authors. You know, I oh. F. Scott Fitzgerald and uh, John Dos Passos Hemingway and people like that and then of course you know I started reading um American thriller writers and so on so but um but I read a lot of non-fiction I've always obviously I have to write you know I have to do a lot of research for my books which I I you know part of that is primary research which I do myself you know shoe leather wearing out and then <laughs> the other thing is you know using other people's re research um right and and actually people often ask me about what I read and, and I, I never read fiction when I'm writing fiction because mm. I happen I know how easy it is however you try to do this that you can so easily adopt someone else's voice and I have my own voice and I don't want to be distracted by someone else's stories so right. I don't I don't read fiction I read a lot of non-fiction well, you must. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because and, and the books, there's so much. nothing to do with my book. So, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it all gets in there. It all gets in there. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it sure does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you ever met somebody that you really wanted to put in your book as perhaps a murdered victim? <laughs> because they just. <laughs> well, that would be telling, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I better, I better, let's steer away from that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, um, I, uh, I, um, no I, I've never used real people in my book. I've never used real people. Although, funnily enough, when uh, Maisie Dobbs, when the series first came out, my very oldest, oldest, dearest friend, her kids were, were teenagers. You know, they've all got kids of their own now. Um, but they were teens. And she said she, she told me that... Um, and then the, the two girls had actually read Maisie Dobbs and then Birds of a Feather and, and so on. And uh, she was telling them off or, or, or lecturing them on something one evening at the dinner table. And suddenly so the oldest went, oh, all right, Priscilla. <laughs> 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 and of course, Priscilla is Maisie's best friend. And uh, I, I don't know. Maybe That's great. She, she, <laughs> my, my, my friend is, 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 let's say she's, she's one of these people that tells it like it is. She's very down to earth and uh, just the loveliest person. But um, I don't know, maybe there is a little tiny bit of Priscilla in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So you also have, um, so this book, What Would Maisie Do? Yes, yes. This is a great book. So I, 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 haven't, I don't journal very often, but I did pick this up and I read through it. And um, there is, there's quotes in there. I, by Maisie and by other people. And there, there's this one, listen, listen and attend to the ear of your heart, Maisie. And it's, it's so very spiritual and healing and, and she's so spiritual. Did you have a spiritual background I, or a psych, psychology background even because she has so much of it? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a, um, oops, is that a strange noise I'm hearing? Um, I don't have a formal spiritual background or a formal psychology background. Although actually when I was in college, I studied psychology because I did a, um, an education, uh, education English degree. So, um, part of the education is you, you study the psychology of education and then you, I mean, you get very broadly. That was a long time ago, but I always enjoyed it. I, I, it's something I'm interested in. Um, and, um, in terms of, um, uh, spirituality, um, I, I was interested in, you know, yes, obviously I've, it's something I've, I've looked into, something I've, um, I've read about different uh, faiths and experiences. 
and of course in my coaching work you know you're um which i haven't practiced for years because i'm a, a very much a full-time writer and have been for 20 years now 18 years um but you know you're you're uh, talking to people uh, about you know different areas of life emotional mm -hmm. physical um and spiritual is is a is a really important aspect of someone's life where their spiritual beliefs if they have them it, if you don't have them that's fine too mm -hmm. but it's it's something to explore and for people to explore so um but what i was interested in was um sort of the the history of um, spiritual engagement and how that right. came about um, and how people were impacted by it in the early part of the last century, which was, in, particularly in Britain, quite interesting. Um, but um, that particular quote, and the origin is, is actually there, um, it's, it's um, the, the character who says that to Maisie is actually um, uh, the Benedictine nun, who is one right. of her mentors. And she she quotes someone else. I, I actually haven't I, I don't have that book with me right now because uh, I'm not actually at home. But um, so it I'm does have the origin. But it, it was such a, you know, um, I think it's such a lovely idea that you listen you know, to the ear of your heart. Right. And there's that heart connection. And the origin of that book is that it, even after the second book in the series, people started to write to me saying, would you do a book of Morris's sayings or more the conversations between uh, Morris Blanche and who's Maisie's mentor and Maisie. And this went on and on and on. And then I realized that's what I wanted to do. That's how I wanted to do it. That I, and so I put it out to readers. What are your, what are your favorites? What are your mm -hmm. favorite passages? And mm -hmm. I picked the ones where they were repeated, the top 28, I think it was. But so what I've given there is an introduction to that quote from the book, that passage, where it came from and what it means to me. And then I've asked a question of the reader, you know, mm -hmm. and what it means to them and how uh, and inviting them to, to use the, the page, journaling pages to express themselves and their connection with that passage. And, and I'm, I've got such a lovely response from readers. And, of course, there's some great photographs in there as well. Um, but, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I tell you where that comes from. I was invited to speak. Um, there's a, a, a lovely lady who runs the, um, it's, uh, the Museum of Nursing, and she's actually at Cannon Beach in Oregon. Oh. And she invited me there to do a presentation. And this... It's an amazing museum. It's part of her house. And we did, I did the presentation at the local library. And that print was in the library and it was for sale. And I, as soon as I looked at it, I thought, that's Blaster. Maisie Dobbs. That's, that's, my, that's Maisie, as she would have been as a nurse. <laughs> so I bought it. <laughs> oh. And I bought the print. And, uh, and of course, there's the acknowledgement there and everything. Mm -hmm. But there's some other thing, other photographs, just to give people a sense of where Maisie was born, where she came from, what Lambeth would have been like when she was a child, which was a very poor area. Um, so that I call them location pieces about the area and, and also asking people to reflect on their place of origin. Thank you for asking about that book, because I had such a wonderful experience writing it. Um, it oh, I'm sure. Time. And um, also in the acknowledgements, there was um, uh, a, a piece about the um, sort of, if, if you want, the, 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 the reason I was prodded to, 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 to write that. Um, there's a, a writer, um, and she's sadly... Um, no longer with us, called Amy Krause Rosenthal. And she, if you, you can look her up on YouTube, she did amazing children's book or books for children and adults. And um, she had, she did this great event in Chicago, but she asked people to make something. So what do you mean? She said, I could make a mess. I can make... <laughs> I can make an entrance. I can make this. And I knew of her because we had the same literary agent. 
and we our birthdays were a day apart so even though i'd never met her there was this sense of connection felt like you knew so, her. <laughs> yes and we felt like we knew each other and it was incredibly sad when she passed away she was very young and um i can always remember thinking going online and watching the video of her throwing out the challenge to people to make something and i thought i'm going to make something and it just came to me to do that and i did a little mock up and i'm no artist mm -hmm. and i showed it to my agent and she said well that's interesting and she showed it to my editor and the editor showed it to the people that do those kinds of books at my publisher harper collins and they all came together and said right well we can do this and of course what they ended up producing was so much nicer than my mock up <laughs> but i gave them all oh. the content i did the research for the photographs and then they put it together and it's 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 a wonderful book and there's also it a is. lovely photograph in there of um this uh, sort of um, stately home in, in England, which was not far from where I grew up, which is how I've always imagined Chelstone Manor to look. And so you can read about that as well. So, but that was uh, in honor, the book was really in honor of um, Amy Crowe's Rosenthal, although it's dedicated to my readers, because I'm yeah. very fortunate it's in my readers. A great book, it's got some history yeah. Yeah. and yeah, photos, as she said, and then it, it's like a guided, journal so then yeah that's your space there yeah and you can add your own favorite comment uh, favorite passages as well because i couldn't add them all <laughs> i couldn't put them all in thank you for asking about that that's lovely oh, it's great book it's a great book yeah. and you'd be glad to know it's right center in the middle of our um women's history month uh we have all the books and that one's right there in the middle so that's great thank you yeah. so um this is one that speaks to my heart, Maisie often goes on walks to get yes. into her head and to think deeper. Um, that's what I do. <laughs> Is this something that you tend to do? Yes, I do. And it's because I've, and I think it goes back to when I was a kid, you know, um, how can you expect your mind to move over a problem or whatever if your body's not moving? Right. And to move the mind you've got to move the body and i do a lot of my thinking when i'm walking um mm -hmm. and you know when for example when i i actually had my coaching practice i would often meet with my clients so you do i mean we weren't doing zoom then but we'd often do phone check-ins and and it's interesting that if i took them to a place with a 360 degree view their idea of what they could accomplish changed because they could see an expanse of possibility before them so yeah. i like to walk in places where i get a good view um you know i'll walk up in the hills near my home and i, I you know i often come back with all these photographs of just oh look at that you know it's it's a cloud over the hills and that where i'm looking down into the valley and i i, I in that expansive view especially if i'm thinking you know how's my day going to go and the, the, the work that I have to do that day, the chapter I have to work on, the scene I have to work on or piece and dialogue I'm working over. It, I find that I have a, a, a much richer idea of how I'm going to approach that. If I start my day walking somewhere where I have a view. So <clears throat> it's almost like it automatically translates to the, 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 the the vista of possibilities. Right. The vista. That's and, a and wonderful way to start. <laughs> I, I, I encourage anyone to do that. You know, I mean, even if you just got to stand on a step ladder and look at your garden, <laughs> <laughs> try that. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's. Uh, well, we're so stimulated with everything. It's good to just step away and just be yeah. able to think. Yeah. And I think I think stepping away is is really important. I mean, I one of the things that's a part of my day is I, I I have a horse. I'm very blessed to be able to do something I'd wanted to do since I was a kid. And uh, um, it's it's really interesting because that's something I it's kind of like you know I work X number of hours and that's my treat is to, mm -hmm. to do that. And I, <laughs> and I train in a certain sport, so. Um, it means I've absolutely, if, if you ride horses, I mean, people know you've absolutely got to concentrate on 
the connection sure. with the horse because if your mind goes off and away you know he's going to think well where did so she, will he? she go where did she go <laughs> to i've got no one there <laughs> She's not concentrating on the job. So it's, it's, and then, you know, it gets me out of my head in another way mm -hmm. and I can go back to my work later. Right. So, That's what yeah. music does for me because you can't concentrate yeah. on too much or else your fingers get all tangled. Yes, up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, exactly. You've got to take your breaks. You've got to take That's your right, breaks. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, Claire had also mentioned this book and this, um, this time next year we'll be laughing. Yeah. Your autobiography. Um, um, memoir. Memoir. So yeah, memoir. I read through the very, very first, the just the um, the prologue last night, and well, you got me. I was just a kind of a mess <laughs> after reading about your dad because it was so. I had gone down that same road that you had gone through, and um, so I'm for sure going to read the rest of it. I just, I it's a fantastic. Just the very first chapter. Um, so in this, um, are there similarities to your childhood, to Maisie's childhood? Um, well, there's, uh, she comes from a part of London that I know. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I, do, I wasn't, uh, I didn't ever live in, well, actually I lived in London for a very short period of time when um, I was a toddler. And, um, but uh, my, actually my grandmother was, uh, came from Lambeth. And, um, but uh, I guess not really, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I, yes and no, in that I understand where her part of London she comes from. Her father is a costermonger, which it, it was a man who sold fruit and veg from uh, a barrow or a mm -hmm. horse drawn cart. And um, although they even referred to the horse drawn as the horse drawn barrows for the costermongers. And um, that was what my grandfather did. And so he would go to Covent Garden in the early hours of the morning, get his, his you know, load up with all the fruit and veg, then he would have his round and his regular customers. So I talk about him because he was very severely wounded in the Great War. And so I, I think what readers will see are um, points of um, where points of inspiration um, not that I have ever written about my family in my work, but where certain things have inspired my work. And in fact, I was, um, it was, it was funny. It was about a, oh gosh, a couple of months ago, um, my literary agent phoned me and said, you've been nominated for an Edgar award. And I said, no, they've made a mistake. I, I didn't publish <laughs> a book last year. And she said, no, 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 it's not for a Maisie Doss book. It's, it's in the biography section and it's for your memoir. And I was absolutely shocked. But, mm -hmm. um, and, but you know, it actually, uh, I actually write about my journey to becoming a writer. And, um, and when I first made that declaration of, that I would become a writer. So the book has sort of, it's got a family history to it because I think, you know, we're all products of our family oh. mythology. For sure. You know, it's, it's I can't write like it or not <laughs> a memoir exactly without <laughs> this is where I come from. You know, this is my this is my DNA, this is who I'm from, mm -hmm. and this is why I'm me, and this is where right. that has led me, you know. Um, and it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's so it was an interesting journey. It was, I, I loved writing, I love I love memoir anyway, I love reading people's memoirs, mm -hmm. and I love the personal essay. And what I love, you know, it's, it's, here's the thing about fiction is that, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with truth. I'm, it, it's in fiction, it's a very um, creative way of touching universal truths in a way. You can mm -hmm. touch truth more readily with fiction than you can with fact. See, I can go to places where the writer of nonfiction can't go. I can go there. And... So I find that quite a powerful thing to be able to do. And what I love about memoir and about the personal essay is that you can, um, you can touch universal truths, which is really interesting because I've had people write to me about how it re certain experiences reminded them of their experiences, and yet they've had right. entirely different backgrounds to mine. Right. You know, they, they were raised in a very different household, a very different time and era, and yet something has resonated. And therefore, it's made them think about things in a different way. 
And, and I think memoir is a very powerful way of doing that. And it's also a good exercise in writing. Yeah, <laughs> you it's know. fantastic. Yeah. I also want to know, what were you upset about something when they took this picture? Oh, I was <laughs> upset. What had happened? Oh. <laughs> you can see what I'm actually doing is picking hops. I'm working. Uh -huh. I was three years old and, uh, uh, you know, kids work, um, parent, you, you know, parents working on the farm. And during that time, hot picking time, you know, also to keep an eye on kids, you gave, you, you made, you put them to work. So I was picking hops. And what had happened, a big bumblebee <laughs> had just crawled out of a hop and stung me on the lip. You can see oh, the lip is starting to... Lip. And someone decided, because I'm in full grump mode, that, <laughs> well, let's stop her tears. Let's take a photograph of her. And so, that should make it all better. <laughs> that make it better. Uh, but you know, the thing is, I can, this is why I'm afraid of things that sting. I, I can still see that big bum and bumblebees don't like to sting you. They really no. would rather not. No, and it's it the end of their life. And it must have looked at me and thought, well, what do I do? I'm probably going to have to sting my way out of this one. Oh, and it no. just went right onto my lip. And I know I'm, I can, and that's why I remember, I vaguely remember they were trying to get this, you can get the stinger out. So I think they got the stinger out, but still it was just like this big thing on my lip. Oh. And I was like, I was, I looked like the incredible sulk, you know? <laughs> I know you're not and crying. I, and I just... thought it was a terrific. And I've always thought that was such a funny picture, but such a funny photograph. I thought, I thought it was great on a, a, to go with the title this time next year. Because that was actually, the title comes from something my dad used to say whenever things got tough in the house, and often they did, you know, for one reason or another. My parents didn't have a lot of money. And he'd always say, never mind. This time next year, we'll be laughing, you know. Well, we've been saying that all year, haven't we? Yeah, yeah exa exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're getting pretty close to the um, question and answer time with Claire. There she is. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Hello. Uh oh, I'm hearing it. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo, a little feedback. Is anybody else hearing that right now? Is that from me? Is that from me? I'm not sure. I I don't know. Kelly, are you hearing any feedback? Or Jacqueline, are I hear, you hearing? I, I hear it occasionally. Okay. But not, hmm. but not when I'm speaking. I just hear it. Okay. Hmm. Um, and Jackie, you're just a little bit quiet. Oh, I can, um, I can, ramp, I can ramp that up. Oh. How about Thank that? Thank you very much. Excellent. I, I, put Thank it, you. I put it down a bit because it was I, I, I was hearing too much. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yes. Well, so thank yell, you. Nobody yell. Well, thank you. I appreciate your doing that. This is, um, you know, this whole new world of technology and trying to balance yeah. these all all of the I, factors. I, it's it's tricky. So um, so great. <laughs> yes, we do have lots of questions, and I have so enjoyed listening to your conversation. And I love you mentioning Amy Krause Rosenthal. Um, she was such an amazing. Um, such an amazing children's author and I love that she that she touched you and inspired that book what would Maisie do that's that's wonderful um absolutely and you can read about it in the acknowledgments <laughs> and and I encourage everybody to to look at some of her go on YouTube and look at her, her TED talks and mm -hmm. look at the video of her in um Chicago and uh with the yellow umbrella and uh, when, oh gosh, it, it, she was just so yes. amazing, so yes. amazing. Yes, and just taken from us far too young. Um, yeah. I read I read her book, um, Uni the Unicorn, at story yeah. times, all the time. Yeah. Um, the unicorn who's just sure that little girls are real. When everybody, <laughs> all the other unicorns tell her that unicorn, that the little girls, oh, those are just imaginary. But so Actually, anyway, I have to tell you something funny about them. Yes. When they, when she was writing that, she got in touch with because we have the same literary agent and said, "Could you ask Jackie about how to?" And it was something to do with how you, how you, how you brush a horse's mane and, and what do you know, all these different things about horses. 
<laughs> that's oh, great. Well, this is what you did. So that was really lovely. Oh, yeah. that's so well, neat. That's yeah, great. I encourage anyone who's never heard of Amy Krause Rosenthal to, to look her up. So, okay, so we have a lot of questions from our from our audience, um, and uh, the the one at the top, um, of course, has to do with your writing process. Um, uh, Anne Marie would like to know what your favorite part of the writing process <laughs> is, um, and what and what is most difficult for you in finishing a book? Well, the favorite part of the process is finishing the book. <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> no, actually. It's a, um, do you know, it, I, I think the thing is that there's, there's not one favorite point because writing a book is like any job that you do that you want to do well. It's a series of ups and downs. You have good days and bad days. And what is a bad day? A day is when you're thinking, oh, you know what? I, I, I'm going to just write my way through this because I'm not, I don't know whether this is right. The great thing is you can always come back to it because one of the most fulfilling parts is actually rewriting is when you go back to it and you start sorting things out and you think, well, that doesn't fit there. So I'm going to put it there or mm -mm, I need to write more there or whatever. Um, so it's it's you know as a as a professional writer you 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 just have to get on with it you know it's you have your good days and bad days but it doesn't but you have to write through your bad days and as I said what is a bad day well it it could be when you've got something else on your mind or whatever and um, and what was the other part of the question there was two parts to that question uh, your favorite part of the writing process which you said was finishing the book and the most <laughs> difficult part for you about finishing a book <laughs> um yeah the most difficult part for me um i'm i'm really not sure how to answer that because um it's it's just i i don't know that i probably when it's published actually that's a difficult part because then your baby is out into the world what something you worked really hard on is out into the world and there's and and then you have to think and I always remember reading an, uh, about this actress who said this, that she never reads her reviews because if you believe the good mm. ones, you've got to believe the bad ones. So don't read any of them. And I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb because mm -hmm. you're always going to get the person that, and because people usually go, I hate to say it, to one of the online things to look at the reviews. And there's always going to be the person that says it's a terrible book because it arrived damaged, you know, and <laughs> something like that. <laughs> or they get the wrong book completely, um, you know, uh, or as is the case of my memoir, someone wrote that uh, it was all very well, but the engine dropped off the back on the way home. <laughs> Why are you reviewing? <laughs> so, <laughs> I tell you oh, my gosh. Laugh, I, 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 can, I can laugh about a lot of things. So I think that it, but it is, it's because it's, you've been holding your breath. You've worked really hard at something. And suddenly it's not yours anymore. It's mm -hmm. out there. It belongs to other people. And it must be like, you know, when people take their baby out for the first time, you know, it's what, what are people going to say? You know, is it going to be, well, what a beautiful ba baby or she could have bought a better stroller than that, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's and but I I you know I I there, there are joys with each part of the process and then there are the difficult days but show me any job that's not like that you know that that is it it's it's my I'm fortunate in that I work on my passion my passion is my work it wasn't always like that in my life you know so uh, I very much appreciate that I'm I um I have this 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 work that I love overall right we're lucky too mm -hmm. <laughs> yep yep um so many of these questions have to do uh with history also so um julie says i appreciate how Maze's experiences in world war one and world war two have made her realize how close the two wars were for British and other Europeans. Um, was it a major objective of yours to bring that tragic perspective of like, oh no, here we go again, another war to the modern reader? Or is it something that you take for granted as a, as a Brit, which happens to be an aha moment for, for Julie as an American? 
Um, it was just something, it was something that's always been there for me, yeah. always. And, and in fact, you know, there are historians, many historians who look upon the period as another 30, another European 30 years war. This has come and gone before. Yeah. And in fact, you know, it's, um, it's almost you see history repeating itself every sort of 100 years, terrifyingly. But, um, you know, so no, that was really quite normal for me. And, and you know, because when I think of it, there's my grandfather who was severely wounded in um, the First World War. And I've often thought, how did he feel when he saw his sons in uniform in the Second World War? My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who was wounded in an explosion in a munitions factory, lost the sight in one eye um, and had several girls alongside her killed. How did she feel when she saw her daughters and son in uniform, uh, daughters and sons in uniform in the Second World War? Um, so you saw that progression. What I've been able to do is actually weave in another progression, which is putting in um, the Spanish Civil War, which I did with A Dangerous Place, because that, you know, was when um, Adolf Hitler and Goering with the Luftwaffe, they, that's where they really launched and practiced Blitzkrieg and Guernica. Yeah. So that was joining the dots. And in this particular um, book, um, as readers will know, I've actually also managed to weave in a little bit about the Middle East, which was in the early 1920s. So you saw these, uh, the, the progression to, to world war again. And it's, it's like, I mean, Britain, in Britain, they started planning the evacuation of children in the event of a bombing in another war in 1917. Tell me they didn't know it was going to happen. They, you know, after the Paris Peace Conference, it was, it was obvious that, that something was going to have to give. So, um, yeah, but thank you for the question. It's a good one. Thank you. Mm. Well, and um, one of our uh, local authors here in Bellingham, Janet, has a question for you. She she writes historical fiction um, very in-depthly and does much research, and her question has to do with research. Um, she says, I find your dad's story fascinating as, as I write about World War II. Do you have, have any idea where he took the messages um, or is this something that your character oh. in the novel is doing? So maybe that might be a spoiler, so you don't have to answer that. <laughs> no, no my, my dad's mass messaging was done between what they called ARP depots, so air raid precautions. <clears throat> and the air raid precautions people were the people that, um, you know, they did everything from, oh, uh, gosh, you know, preparing for air raids. They had people that went around checking, you know, um, everyone's got their blackout curtains closed and not even a sliver of light is showing. Um, and it was really the pr protection of the uh, community in the case of a, an air raid. And they had different depots. So he was running messages between them. So he wasn't running the kind of messages that, um, you know, Freddie Hackett was running, but he was still running messages through bombings. And it was, you know, I, I'm not sure what the content would have been, but something like, you know, this is happening or we've got word of this happening or the radar is showing this or we've just heard this. And they couldn't always trust, you know, phones and radios and things like that because they could be knocked out. Mind you, mm -hmm. so could a little boy running through London. But, you know, like Freddie Hackett, he's thinking if I'm light on my feet, all the time I'm running, the bomb can't get me. Yeah. Which, yeah. Is, prob mm -hmm. which is pretty much what my dad was thinking. Yeah. Wow. Well, the, Janet, uh, Janet also wants to know... Um, uh, if you, how much research you did into the Secret Service? Well, you see, here's the thing about the research, and I'm, I'm sure okay. Janet will absolutely understand this. It's, it's often not how much you do, it's how much you use. And I actually do an awful lot more research than I actually use. Um, I'm, I'm not one of these people that thinks, I've found it out, so I'm going to put it in. I always think research <laughs> is something like um, an iceberg. Only 7% of it should be visible above the surface. Every, but you have to trust that everything else you do is it informs every word you write. You have to trust that it's like this. Uh, it's like um, a vapor that goes in there, um, because if you try to, and I've, I've known writers who, who want to do this, it's like I have done it, so I'm going to get it in there, and then you might as well write narrative nonfiction, really. Um, 
so that I think is the the most important thing. How much work um, research do I do about the Secret Service? I've kind of it's one of those things I've sort of been doing forever. Um, in that I've always been interested, even as a little girl, I was interested in people in in secrets. You know, I'm, I probably wasn't just a nosy kid. You know, it's it's the sort of people that live with secrets. And um, in my memoir, I tell a story about being a very little girl and we lived in a, a rural area walking along and there was this lady that would pass us every day as if we came back from the town. And we, my, my mum was actually walking up from the farm where she did the farm books and I would go with her and the farmer's wife would look after me while my mum was doing all the books. And we would pass this lady because the farm was on what was known as um, crown lands. I, it belonged to the monarchy, therefore the country, and now it's got another title, Forestry Commission or National Pinetum or something. And on that property, on those lands, which were very, very extensive, there were old cottages, old houses and so on. And, and we lived in what was called a tide cottage, but there were some that were known as grace and favor homes. Therefore, they were given to someone who had served the country by the grace and favor of the monarch. That's the whole grace and favor home thing. And this lady okay. lived in one of those. So this is where I go with Janet's question. We were walking along one day, I'm a little girl, and my mum leans down after the lady goes by, and she always had a raincoat on her hat and pulled down, and she, as they said in the village, she would keep herself to herself. And she, um, my mum leaned down and said to me, she's one of those ladies that parachuted into France in the war. And I went, what's a parachute? And my mum <laughs> said she realised then that maybe that was a story for another time. <laughs> And it was one of those things that a lot of people didn't even know about that sort of thing then. But, you know, people in small towns, they know. And also um, um, Vera Atkins, who was famously, um, she joined the SOE, I think, in uh, uh, 1942 and um, became uh, literally very associated with the uh, special operations executive. And she lived in um, sort of the next town over from my mum and dad, a very small it was a village, really. Um, and until her later years, and I believe she lived in a grace and favor house in that village. So, um, and but then she went into a nursing home on the coast because she was quite elderly. So people knew about that, and and even as um, you know, I can remember being in my teens and really getting interested in women, in particular, working for the special operations executive. And then, of course, more um, more information was declassified. And, uh, and and now a lot of people are reading about it as if it's only just come out, but it's not only just come out. It was starting to be declassified several decades ago. So um, have I done a lot of research? Yes, um, but I can't pinpoint it because it's been going on for so long. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. I would I've think that at, it would be a constant, a constant yeah, thing been, you're doing. I've been at, at, and I've got loads of books on the subject and, uh, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was also a very old film made. Actually, it was made during the war, an information film, towards the end of the war because they didn't want to give too much away. And they had two agents in it showing what and it's. I think it's available on YouTube actually, um, showing this is what their job was like, you know, and the whole idea of jumping out of an aircraft. Good lord, you know. I mean, I'm one of those people that my idea of being on an aircraft is checking in and someone saying to me. Or we're just going to upgrade you to first class, and think, oh wow! <laughs> and I got that, and I got that flight really cheap. And then you sit there with your glass of champagne, and you, you have no intention of jumping out at any point. You know? No, um, so. and jumping, and jumping out into into you don't even know where you're going. Right. You know what exactly. you're going to land on, where you're going to. Yeah. yeah. So Gosh. you know, actually, yeah. you know, I je I jest. So you know, I I. I still actually think it's really nice if you got upgraded for nothing. <laughs> it's happened to me exactly two times, and both times, boy, it was just felt like a miracle. <laughs> you, know, you, just ne you just never want to go back to normal life again. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Um, gosh, well, this I, that this pretty much takes us right to an hour, and I, okay. I just can't thank you, thank you both enough for for your I conversation. Sorry, I didn't get oh, some more questions. So fun. 
There are a lot, um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't uh, didn't get to them as well. Um, but we do want to be, you know, mindful of your time. So um, thank you so much, and please remember everybody that if you click on that green link center screen there that says "Purchase the Consequences of Fear" and other titles here, uh, you can go straight to the Village Books website there and purchase this as well as what would Maisie do and this time next year we'll be laughing. So, and do it's remember there. that we do have all the autographed uh, book plates if you purchase um, the new book to soon <laughs> while supplies last. So, um, gosh, Jackie, thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you, you so much. And, thank you. And thank you, Kelly. You were just uh, lovely. And uh, this has been such joy. And thank you to everybody that joined us. I mean, I'm. I'm really grateful and I, I, I'm, you know, obviously I'm a writer. My readers are very special people in my world. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for loving thank Maisie you. Dobbs. Yeah. Yay, Maisie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's a perfect note on which to end. Yay, Maisie. All right. Yay, well, Maisie. I think with that, we'll say good night. Okay. Good night. Good, good night, night everybody. everybody.